thank you so much for coming and thank you for much, so much for staying. For those of you who have participated in this short concert, which hopefully inspired you to join us tomorrow. And I should say the, the room in the Global Scholars Hall is 123. 123 Global Scholars Hall is the, uh, the hall for the concert tomorrow and it will start at six o'clock. But now it's my special delight to introduce to you our speaker. Ken Hammond is an old friend. He is also a mentor. He is a long time, may I say, father of the Society for Ming Studies <laughs> and the long time editor of the, the journal um, of Ming Studies. But much more, he is a specialist for pre-modern China with a focus on the history of the Ming Dynasty. If you want to know anything about the craziness of Wen Zhengming, he is the person to ask. He knows a lot, and I mean a lot, about the intellectual circles of the Ming and who influenced whom, what was the background of the political intrigue, what was the program of politics, and what were the aspirations of the scholars. He has published a lot. This, uh, his latest book is a biography of Yang Jisheng, which came out last year. You may all know him perhaps through a series of lectures that he produced for um, the Great Courses series, which is titled From Yao to Mao. Very inspiring. And he also edited two volumes that are very, give a very good insight into um, biographies of people in China, intellectuals in China, who were not as famous as the hundred most important persons you know of each era. The human tradition in pre-modern China and the human tradition in modern China carry his signature. Now, lately, he has started a new project, and that's what he is going to introduce to us today. He's very interested in the urban development in China in the Ming Dynasty, but not only. You will tell us how far you want to carry the project. And to look at cities, to look at urban history, of course, you, uh, requires that you are able to read maps. The knowledge of maps, Chinese maps, is a very um, specific knowledge because maps have been created and transmitted over time, have been edited and changed without necessarily always marking who stepped in at what time and left a mark by making edits to a map. So this is very meticulous work. But without further ado, I would like to welcome Ken Hammond to give us his insights into his new projects on cartography of cities. Ina. Introductions are always so embarrassing. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's always nice to uh, come to Oregon. Uh, I live in southern New Mexico, uh, which is a somewhat different environment. Um, so uh, it's nice to come here and absorb some moisture. Uh, although I, you know, I come and we have blue skies, and it's kind of if I wanted blue skies, I could have stayed home. Um, I'm, uh, um, as Ina says, embarked on a, uh, a new research project, and uh, so the comments that I want to make tonight are a little preliminary, um, but I think that, uh, at least I hope that they will be of, uh, of some interest. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been teaching at New Mexico State University for the last 20 years, and 
uh, I have been uh, very fortunate to have uh, sort of washed up on those shores uh, because the history department at New Mexico State University is a particularly um, collegial and comfortable place uh, to work, and it's also a very rich scholarly and intellectual environment. Uh, and it's an environment where, unlike um, some larger programs, uh, uh, there's not, uh, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of specialists in any given area. It's a department full of, of people who uh, have their particular interests and, and uh, focuses, but we, uh, uh, we don't have, uh, uh, you know, a whole Chinese history program or a whole uh, Latin American history program or something like that. And so the effect of that is that we talk to each other a lot and we talk across our particular focuses and disciplines. And I have found that to be over the years a particularly rewarding environment. And I'm going to uh, uh, have to embarrass my, my former colleague, uh, Marsha Weisiger, who's here with us uh, tonight because I, I, I tend to uh, uh, use her, my experience with her as an example that uh, she is an environmental historian, a uh, historian of, of uh, the American environment primarily, but um, for a number of years before she was lured away to come up here and, and teach at Oregon, um, her office was right next to mine and we spoke a lot and, and uh, she helped me to learn a lot about environmental history and the role of environmental history, the role of the environment in, in human history in general. And that, uh, that made me a better historian of China. And uh, uh, that, uh, that's a process that has continued uh, at, uh, at New Mexico State in our, in our department. And, and actually, this current project of mine is a result of similar further uh, interactions. And if I can make this work properly, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is obviously not a map of a Chinese city. Uh, this is a map of Venice. Uh, this is a map from the year 1500. Uh, it's a very famous map called the Barbary map, and it, uh, it, it purports to show, although you can, you can find some tiny problems with this, it purports to show every building, every structure uh, in the city of Venice uh, uh, reasonably accurately. And, and indeed, it, it does if you don't push it to the level of 100%. Um, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good representation. Well, this map, or a copy of this map, hangs on uh, the wall in the office of another of my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Elizabeth Herodovich. And we were, uh, at one point, talking about maps. She's a historian of Venice, a historian of Italy, and, and is herself interested in, in working on some projects in cartographic history. And she was showing me this map, and it made me think about uh, this map which is a very famous map produced in 1750 under the Qianlong Emperor of the city of Beijing. You can see on the left the, the full image um, and on the right a, a detail. This too is a map which shows quite accurately uh, every building, every structure in, within the city of, of Beijing um, uh, represented uh, in, in, in great detail and with uh, uh, a certain amount of, of labeling, not much. It's mostly simply a representation of the physical space of the capital. Now these maps, the Barbary map and the Chenlong map, are separated by uh, 250 years. Um, and actually, as it turns out, um, there's an Italian uh, uh, Jesuit who worked on the production of the Chenlong map. So there's a link between these maps. Uh, between the, uh, the European and the Chinese cartographic traditions. And indeed, in many ways, uh, there's been a traditional view that, uh, that uh, uh, Chinese uh, cartography historically was, was somewhat less developed, somewhat less um, accurate or precise or something like that uh, than European uh, uh, cartography. And if you read the history of cartography in, in Western languages, it tends to, as much scholarship does, focus on the European experience. Um, nonetheless, these, looking at these two maps uh, was, a, was a stimulating uh, thing for me, and it, it began to make me wonder about, about the representation of cities, the way in which cities were portrayed historically in China before uh, the 18th century, and, and whether uh, a map like this uh, would have been conceivable in earlier times, whether maps like this were produced in earlier times. I didn't really know much uh, about, uh, about maps of cities or indeed about Chinese cartography 
uh, in general. So I have been led over the past year or so to embark upon a, uh, an exploration of this topic, and it has proven to be, at least for me, uh, quite a fascinating um, area. The history of cities in China is a very dynamic field these days. Uh, there have been uh, uh, a number of very important uh, books published talking about the nature of, of cities and urban places in China. Um, there's a classical Western understanding of this, uh, largely formulated by the German sociologist Max Weber, uh, which argues that, that Chinese cities aren't really cities at all in the, in the sense of, of the European uh, experience, that somehow European cities are real cities and Chinese cities were somehow simply kind of larger administrative centers and, and not really possessing the, the characteristics or features that we associate with urban history in the West. Um, but recent uh, scholarship has challenged that quite significantly, beginning largely with William Rowe's History of Hanko uh, that came out back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, and has developed quite a bit since then. Uh, so our understanding of the nature of Chinese cities has been evolving, uh, and we understand that like many other things in Chinese history, it's not a static phenomenon. There isn't a f an entity that we can think of as the Chinese city, which emerges at some point in the distant past and then remains as a, as a sort of st uh, stagnant object. Uh, in fact, Chinese cities, like Chinese society in general, um, are quite historically dynamic and go through very significant transformations across time, particularly uh, during the great changes that take place between the Tang Dynasty and the Sung Dynasty about a thousand years ago. A time when uh, China in general was uh, being reconfigured by a variety of forces, including uh, quite significantly the emergence of a, a very dynamic commercial economy. It's a period where uh, in many ways uh, what we used to call uh, the sprouts of capitalism, but which today in a more neutral uh, rhetoric, I suppose, we often refer to as early modernity. Uh, but it's where a complex of changes having to do with the spread of, of markets, the development of commodity production, regional economic specialization, the expansion of long-distance trade, uh, a number of, of dynamics uh, begin to unfold within Chinese society and Chinese economic life. And perhaps not surprisingly, we also see significant changes in uh, Chinese urban life. Uh, the city uh, uh, in earlier periods had been uh, a very highly regulated space in which uh, there are often extensive uh, systems of walls and gates within cities and people's re uh, residence was highly controlled and regulated and, and it was an environment that was uh, in many ways uh, meant to be sort of a, sort of a steady state. Uh, but by the Song Dynasty, that changes quite radically, and cities become much more dynamic. Uh, the, the spread of the commercial economy, the extension of the commercial activity, uh, perhaps uh, necessitates this, certainly facilitates it. And urban environments change um, quite a bit as we move into the 11th and 12th centuries and, and on down from there. Not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, the ways in which cities are represented graphically also begin to change uh, around this time in the Song Dynasty. And so much of what I've wound up looking at has been images of cities that have been produced uh, since about the 12th century. Uh, down, I, I work, as, as Ina mentioned in her introduction, I work primarily in the Ming Dynasty, and I've kind of Put a, put a limit of, uh, of the 17th century on the things that I'm looking at, even though, of course, the Chenlong map is, is 18th century. But I'm trying to look at, at uh, Chinese cartographic traditions prior to uh, any point at which they may have been influenced by the European uh, uh, experience. Uh, with the arrival of the Jesuits in the late 16th century, you start to get greater uh, cross-fertilization uh, in a variety of intellectual realms. Uh, so I'm trying to keep a focus that goes back before that. So I'm basically looking at Sung uh, through Ming, uh, sort of uh, 11th, 12th through late 16th, early 17th century China. And what we find is that cities are represented in, in quite an interesting variety of ways. And I'm, I'm mostly interested in maps, but maps are not the whole story. This, of course, is the very famous, a couple of sections from the very famous uh, scroll painting, the, the Qingming Shanghe Tu, the uh, uh, Qingming Festival on the River. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, uh, thought of uh, historically as a representation of the northern Sung capital uh, at Kaifeng, although I understand that an interesting dissertation has been produced here at the University of Oregon challenging that and suggesting that at least in some versions of this scroll, what's portrayed is actually the city of Suzhou. Um, I, not the original, but later copies. Okay, so uh, uh, this though, the, this is the this is the uh, version of the scroll that's in the Palace Museum in Beijing, um, and and dates back to the 12th century and is a representation of of northern Song Kaifeng. And what's interesting about it um, is uh, that so much of it is focused on uh, what we might think of as uh, as the the life of the commercial street. Uh, it shows uh, uh, a very dynamic urban environment. Uh, it shows in great detail shops and people, uh, all kinds of products, all kinds of interactions taking place in a way that uh, certainly demonstrates and, and, uh, and shows off uh, quite a sense of civic pride, quite a sense of, uh, of a feeling of, 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 of the city, the fe a feeling of, of an urban space, which um, seems to contradict in some ways uh, certainly the Weberian idea of the city as simply a kind of administrative shell. Uh, not surprisingly, given the dynamism of the, of the Song economy, uh, this kind of representation suggests that when we think about the traditional city, uh, we need to think of it in a, in a more fluid and, and uh, an expansive way. Well, there are a lot of ways in which cities get represented. Um, this is a, a landscape painting from around 1200 of, uh, of uh, the southern Song capital at, uh, at Hangzhou. Uh, it, clearly recognizable. Anybody who's been down there uh, uh, would see this. Uh, of course, it's in, it's in what we think of as a bird's eye view, which is an interesting perspective. Uh, uh, the, the, the nature of Song dynasty landscape painting often involves this kind of perspective. Uh, but what uh, also is fascinating is that we see it like this. This is a gazetteer map of, uh, of Hangzhou from a little bit later, but not much later, around 1270, uh, which really is pretty similar in its uh, images to what we see in the, uh, in the landscape painting, suggesting that there are associations, there are links, there's a, a, an interaction, an interplay between what we might think of as a more purely aesthetic representation in a landscape painting and what is a more... Um, perhaps data-oriented, informational-oriented uh, image here produced uh, for, a, uh, for a gazetteer. Uh, the city itself is at the bottom of the image here. Uh, you can see the walls uh, of the capital and uh, just a little bit uh, uh, suggestion of, of the internal space of the city. It's mostly situating it within its larger context here at West Lake. Uh, but, uh, but, but this is a very different uh, uh, kind of image from the landscape painting and yet clearly uh, representing the same place and probably uh, uh, you know, whoever was, uh, was uh, carving or, or drawing this uh, representation, this map, would have been aware of representations of the city within the landscape tradition. So I just look at these initial images to, to suggest some of the range of possibilities for how cities uh, can be represented. But I want to focus uh, a little bit more and talk a little bit more extensively about just a few other uh, images uh, that, that suggest that when we think about Chinese maps in particular, uh, there are real, um, real issues, real agendas uh, that are being... Uh, implemented that are being advanced by the by the producers of these. This, uh, the image on the left is a, a stele uh, that was carved in the year 1229 uh, that shows uh, the city of Suzhou, a city we know today as, as Suzhou in those days as you can see it's called Pingjiang. Um, and I, and I, I went to see this uh, uh, in, in June in Suzhou. It's, uh, it stands in a, in a museum there in the old Confucian temple. Uh, and it's big. I, I had seen pictures of it. I didn't realize quite how large it is. It's about nine feet tall. Uh, it's a, quite an impressive uh, uh, piece to, to, to stand in front of and to encounter kind of, kind of in person. Um, I, I put up on the right just uh, to, to, to hearken back to, to some of the comparative dimensions, some of the ways in which my own interest in this was piqued by, by the European model. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, an Italian city called Imola uh, that dates to 1506. This is drawn by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, 
And this is often held up by Western cartographic historians as uh, the real beginning of modern uh, cartography. This kind of view, this looking down from above view is, is what's called, I have learned, an ichnographic uh, view. Uh, and this, uh, this is carried out by a very careful process of, uh, of surveying. Uh, uh, da Vinci left notebooks uh, describing how he had produced this map. And it's often seen as a real triumph of, of uh, Renaissance scholarship and intellectual life in the West. Uh, but I would suggest that the, uh, the carving of the stele on the, on the left indicates that uh, this is not something which, in fact, has its absolute origins in, in the European Renaissance, but, but it certainly is paralleled by uh, developments much earlier uh, in, uh, in Chinese cartographic practice. Just a couple of uh, close-ups uh, of the, the Sujo stele uh, to show the level of detail that, uh, that's incorporated here. It shows the walls of the city, it shows uh, 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 roadways within the city, it shows the canal network uh, within the city, the connection between Suzhou and uh, its, uh, uh, the Grand Canal that goes nearby, uh, the moat that surrounds the city. Uh, docking areas, markets within the city, different kinds of administrative centers, educational facilities, all kinds of details about the, uh, the city are included uh, in, this, uh, in this map. Let me go back to the larger image. Now this, as I said, this was carved in 1229. It is produced uh, uh, at the instigation of the local magistrate, and it is uh, meant to be a, uh, a, a, I suppose we could say, a celebration, a commemoration of the completion of a, uh, a two-year-long uh, project, which, which uh, perhaps it's uh, anachronistic to refer to it this way, but, but I think of as a project of urban renewal. Uh, Sujo in the, uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries was a, a rapidly developing uh, center of economic activity in the Jiangnan area. Uh, its location along the Grand Canal, its integration into other canal networks, other trading networks uh, 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 around the Jiangnan region, uh, made it one of the, the most dynamic uh, centers of early modern economic development uh, in China. And uh, it had reached a point by the 1220s where uh, the sort of chaotic pace of commercial development had, uh, had, had, had really disrupted the internal organization of the city. Suzhou is a, a very ancient city going back to the Warring States period over 1,500 years before this. Um, and, uh, uh, it had, but it had become, it had become quite, uh, quite jumbled. Uh, there had been a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, sort of ramshackle building of things and... Uh, 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 markets and shops and other kinds of uh, manufacturing activities springing up in one place or another. And in 1227, the local magistrate decided that it was time uh, to try to uh, get things a little more under control. And so they embarked on a program which was uh, subsumed under a, a sort of slogan or motto, which was streets in front, water in back. Uh, and the idea was to organize the city, to, to, to uh, sort of standardize the city in a way that where there were roadways and, and uh, buildings uh, along them, that the fronts of the shops, the fronts of the buildings should face the roadways and the backs of the shops should be oriented along the canals, which is a very common sense uh, kind of approach, but it had been, uh, uh, it had been uh, a much more chaotic environment. So over these two years, 1227, 1228, um, the whole city went through a process of, of sort of getting cleaned up, getting rebuilt. Uh, and when that was done, when that process was completed, they had this, uh, the magistrate had this steely commission. And it was uh, carved and set up uh, and, uh, of course, uh, still exists today. It has come down to us today. And this suggests one real uh, important set of functions that a map uh, can play. It, it, is a, it is an administrative gesture. Uh, it's something carried out by the local government, by the magistrate. Um, it records uh, a, a governmental initiative. It shows the results of this, uh, this program of, uh, of urban renewal, if you will. And it is also uh, a matter of public display. Uh, this, uh, this was put on display uh, in a place where people could come by and look at it. Uh, and I think that it reflects also uh, in, in that capacity a sense of, uh, of urban uh, civic pride. You know, look at, look at our city, look at, at what we've done here, look at what we've accomplished here. And these are all 
uh, attributes, these are all features that I think uh, 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 tell us a lot about the nature of the changing nature of Chinese cities in the early modern period. Um, that, that we cannot think of them uh, simply as these sort of uh, uh, bland administrative uh, centers, but that they, in fact, uh, had uh, uh, a quite complex social and economic environments, and that uh, those could be represented in, uh, in, a, in a, uh, a form such as, such as this uh, steely map. Uh, it's very accurate. You can, if you, if you take, uh, if you go to uh, like a Google Earth image of Suzhou today, or uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, aerial photograph of Suzhou from World War II during the, the bombing surveys, uh, you can lay a, a modern image of Suzhou on top of this uh, map, and if you scale it right, it, it's a pretty good fit. Uh, so we can see that, that the accuracy of the surveying, the accuracy of the graphic representation was quite high. Um, this is an aspect of cartographic history that, that has been the focus of a lot of discussion, uh, whether uh, Chinese cartographers, Chinese map makers were, were capable of producing uh, this level of accuracy. And, and this steely certainly suggests that, uh, that they were. Now, the fact that this kind of accurate graphic representation could be produced doesn't mean that that was always the goal or the objective of map makers uh, in traditional uh, times, in imperial times. And in fact, if we look at other kinds of representations, we can see that uh, they may not have that same level of scientific accuracy. This is a gazetteer map of Suzhou from uh, the early 16th century. And although it is certainly recognizable as the same city, uh, uh, the, the shape of the, uh, the walls around it, the position of the gates, the position of the, uh, the water courses, the layout of the city uh, internally, uh, the location of, uh, of key buildings, uh, this, this would tell us if it didn't actually say in the corner that it was a map of Suzhou. Uh, we could tell from, from, the, from the information, the accuracy of the information, the presence of the hills along the west side there. Uh, it's the same city, it's the same place that's represented in the, in the Steely map. And yet, you can see that, that the proportions are not the same. Uh, this is not, you couldn't take this and lay this over a modern photograph, aerial photograph or satellite photograph of Suzhou, and have it be the kind of uh, direct uh, fit that, that the, the, the 1229 Steely is. So what does that, uh, what does that mean? Why, why would that be the case? Why would a map like this be produced uh, almost 300 years after the Suzhou Steely uh, and, and yet not have that same level of, uh, of accuracy? Well, obviously it's not because anybody was incapable of doing that. Uh, that was a kind of representation that could be produced and yet the makers of this map chose to, to have it look like this. Um, and this has to do, I think, largely with the nature of gazetteers. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with them, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be saying, repeating some stuff that you probably already know, but um, gazetteers are, are largely local histories. Uh, they, can, they can exist on, on a number of levels. Uh, pro provincial gazetteers uh, are, are published. But many, many gazetteers are, are histories of particular prefectures or even particular towns. And they contain lots of information about a particular place. Uh, they include descriptions of, uh, of the, the, the location. They include accounts of local products. They include biographies of famous local people. They include descriptions of transportation networks, how this particular locality is, is integrated into larger uh, uh, systems. Um, all kinds of information in textual form is recorded uh, in uh, a gazetteer, and they're, 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 they're very detailed. They're often produced, uh, 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 if you go and, and look at the history of a given place, you can find gazetteers that are produced every few generations. Uh, it's, a, it's an activity that brings together local elites uh, and the imperial state, because uh, generally when we, when we read the introductions to gazetteers, uh, the local magistrate, who is an imperially appointed official, is, is listed frequently as the editor-in-chief, and then there will be an editorial committee that's composed of, of prominent local uh, citizens. Um, so gazetteers are a, are a joint production between local elites and the imperial state, and they, uh, they, they reflect, again, 
uh, both administrative interests because they are meant to, they're official publications, they are meant to provide a kind of official account of a place, uh, but there are also exercises, I think, in, uh, in uh, civic pride, in, in pointing out the great things that we have here. Uh, uh, they're kind of uh, boosterish, uh, 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 chamber of commerce, if you will, kind of, uh, of productions uh, that, uh, that, that are designed to promote a particular sense of place, a particular pride of place uh, that, uh, that, that's very important. But they don't, the maps that are associated with them don't have to have the same level of precision. Uh, this is a map which, if you're reading the text, uh, uh, you could use this map as a, as a reference point, as a kind of handy reference point. You're not going to take this out, although to some extent you could, but, but you're not basically going to take this out and try to, try to base a property survey or even necessarily a, a walking tour of the city on it. But if, you're, if you want to have a way to have a, a sort of graphic or geographic sense of what is described in the text of the, of the gazetteer, this is a perfectly functional uh, map. It, it gives the proper relationships. It identifies enough... Uh, 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 specific local places, and, and in general, it, it conforms to the geographic realities. It doesn't have to be as scientifically accurate. It's meant to, to be more evocative, to, to be a supplement to a textual portrait rather than a complete uh, comprehensive rendition in its own, in its own right. So this suggests that, that uh, Chinese cartography can be uh, multi-purpose. Uh, it, it, can, it can have a number of different intents uh, and, uh, uh, and techniques for, for conveying information. Gazetteers are official publications, as I said. <coughs> the, the, the local magistrate plays a critical role. Uh, they are produced with the, uh, the resources of the state. But they were not the only ways in which information about particular locations was conveyed uh, in graphic form. This is a map of, uh, of the city of Beijing uh, that comes from uh, a book published in, in 1550 uh, by a gentleman named Zhang Jue uh, that's called the, um, let's see, the Alleys and Lanes of the Five Districts of the Capital. Uh, and it is a guidebook. It is a, uh, a handy reference work uh, that could be used by certainly by residents, but perhaps even more conveniently by visitors to the capital. And it provides uh, a wealth of information, really basically a street-by-street, neighborhood-by-neighborhood, district-by-district narrative description of uh, the imperial capital of the city of Beijing. This map appears at the beginning uh, of the book before you get into the text itself. Um, Anyone who has a familiarity with the city of Beijing knows that this is not a very good map uh, of Beijing. Its, its uh, proportions are, are seriously wrong. Uh, uh, it makes the city look wider than it is tall, and, and in fact, it's exactly the opposite. Um, so this is, this is not a, a, a masterpiece of cartographic scientific accuracy. And yet, uh, as with the Gazetteer map, it contains a wealth of information that is actually pretty accurate. It shows the location of key sites. Uh, uh, you can see on the east and west sides, the, the, uh, uh, a little bit towards the, uh, about, I guess about two-thirds of the way up, you can see the four uh, arches, the four pilo that we know as uh, uh, Dongse and Shise, and down below them, the individual pilo that we know as Dongdan and Shidan, still location names, place names in Beijing today. Uh, the central axis of the city is clearly uh, displayed, the Tiantan, uh, the, the lakes, the back lakes and the, and the lakes beside the Imperial Palace, the palace itself. And then scattered around on the surface uh, of the map are the names of 33 different neighborhoods and districts uh, scattered around the city. And, and they're, not, uh, they're not exactly in the places that they ought to be, although they're in the general parts of the city. Outside, there are references to nearby um, uh, locations, including on the upper left-hand corner, uh, 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 the Zhuyongguan up in the uh, up in the uh, uh, up in the Great Wall, uh, a pass that goes back to Mongol times. Uh, quite a quite a distance. It looks like it's just outside the city here, but it's actually quite a distance away. So there are there are 
hints, clues, information here that would allow uh, a, a visitor, a traveler, or, or even a resident to, to get uh, a reasonable spatial orientation, but without the accompanying text, uh, this, this would not be a very good way to find your way around the capital. Zhang Jue writes in his preface to, uh, to the book that his intention, and he's talking specifically about the map at this point, his intention is to give the reader something to hold in his hand which would uh, allow him to basically uh, hold the city, hold the, the, the town in his hand. Uh, that it represents, that it, it gives you enough information to be able to enter into, first, his description of the city, and second, the experience of the city itself. So this is a map that's produced not for official administrative purposes, but for private consumption. It's a map that uh, could be utilized by a traveler uh, or a resident. Um, as part of uh, an exploration. It's an exploration that also has a textual dimension, and, it, and it, it emphasizes the linkages between text and image that are so important uh, in, uh, in, in Chinese urban cartography. Uh, a map such as the, the Great Steely Map of Suzhou has a lot of text on it, uh, but here we have maps that, that, that are, are clearly linked and integrated with uh, a, a very elaborate, a very detailed textual uh, representation. Not all maps have that level of, uh, of uh, uh, linkage to a, to a larger publication. And um, the last one I want to look at uh, is this image. It's, it, uh, this map is, is, comes from right around the same time as Zhang Zhuo's map. Uh, it, it, we understand that it was carved uh, perhaps in the 1530s or 40s, but not printed until uh, later, or at least not printed in, in editions that, uh, that have survived and that we know about today. Um, this map is a, uh, uh, again, it's, it's not a, a scientifically accurate presentation uh, of the city. Uh, the, the text at the top, uh, which is probably too small to read in this uh, image, uh, is actually a list of the emperors of the Ming Dynasty. It's a list of, of uh, their, their, their uh, formal uh, uh, reign titles and, and the years in which they uh, ascended to the throne, uh, uh, which suggests, uh, as does the name of this, this is simply called the, 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 the walls and palaces of the city. Um, it suggests the, the, the key focus on the imperial state uh, that's involved here. And I want to point out a couple of things about this map. It, it is a map of the whole city. Um, it has down here the, the, great, the gates in the southern wall. This is Xuanwu Men and Zhengyang Men and Chongwen Men. And, and the, other, the other gates around the city are portrayed. So it does, it does show the whole city. But clearly, the focus is on the imperial palace here in the center. Um, and it's a map that. Um, includes some interesting figures. Uh, you can see here in the center, uh, up here there's a, there's a sort of banquet going on. There's a table, there are, in, there are people standing around it. Uh, obviously, the representation of these people is grossly disproportionate uh, to, to their position within the city. Uh, there are some folks, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's some other people and, and animals uh, represented down in this area. Um, outsized, larger than life people, but uh, people who are put in the image, people who are put in into this uh, image of the city uh, to, to demonstrate, to sort of illustrate uh, certain social roles, most particularly in this, in this instance, uh, their roles as officials or as servants in the imperial palace. So there's a, they, they, they're there to be kind of witnesses uh, they, they, they represent their, it, you know, it's showing this isn't some abstract physical space. This is a social environment. These people are here. They can, they could, if, if you could talk to them, they would attest. They would testify to the accuracy uh, of, this, uh, of this image. Uh, interestingly, and, and uh, I, I didn't include one of these, but uh, uh, this same technique, this same uh, motif of having uh, uh, sort of witnesses standing uh, in an urban environment is something that we see in uh, early modern uh, maps in Europe as well, uh, and it suggests again that there are there are parallels here. These aren't there's there's no influence back and forth at this point, but there are parallels uh, in the ways in which uh, uh, cities cities do get represented. So. 
there's a there's a, a wide range of images, um, paintings like the the spring uh, festival on the, on the river, uh, the the landscape painting of Hangzhou, uh, that that are basically aesthetic products. Uh, they they are images of the city. They are views of the city that emphasize its its commercial dynamism or its scenic location. Uh, its uh, its uh, its role as a as a as a local center of one type or another. Uh, often these are images of imperial capitals. Both uh, the, the the scroll painting of uh, Kaifeng and the images of Hangzhou are produced while they're imperial capitals. But there are very important images of uh, of non capital cities. Uh, the, the 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 images of Suzhou, whether it's the very accurate uh, steely map uh, celebrating a, a program of urban renewal or the less accurate but still uh, uh, reasonable uh, gazetteer representations or uh, a guidebook meant for private consumption or a map like this. Uh, as far as we can tell, this map was, was produced uh, as a single sheet it's not part of a uh, of a larger publication, uh, and uh, may have been available. Uh, uh, this is something I need to find out more about, but uh, was probably available uh, for purchase in uh, in bookstores and marketplaces. It it includes uh, uh, the Liaolichang Book Market area of uh, Beijing as uh, as one of the sites that it identifies. Um, and uh, uh, you know this may well have been something that uh, that residents or travelers to the city would have purchased as a as a souvenir, as a memento, as a way to uh, uh, commemorate their their experience of visiting the imperial capital. So, maps serve a large variety uh, of purposes, and those purposes seem to fall into uh, uh, sort of three general areas. Uh, they are, on the one hand, uh, uh, official. Uh, they are administrative. They are exercises, uh, some of them, especially gazetteer maps, uh, but also the Sujo Steely, are exercises in power. They are expressions of the power of the imperial state. They are also reminders of the interplay between the imperial state and, uh, and local elites. Uh, but those elites are themselves changing in the early modern period as the commercial economy becomes more dynamic and more viable. Commercial publishing uh, plays a great role uh, in, uh, in the production and circulation of maps. Zhang Jue's guidebook to Beijing would have been published by a commercial uh, outfit uh, available for purchase, again, in, in bookstores around the city and perhaps around the country. Um, and a single sheet map like this uh, would have been a, a commercial uh, enterprise, a commercial publication. So there's an official function, but there's also a private function. There are um, Purposes of, uh, of uh, again, of power, uh, to say, to show off the effectiveness, the power of the state uh, in controlling and regulating society or in carrying through a program of, of uh, construction and renewal, such as in Sujo. But there are also aesthetic functions. There, uh, there's a, a, a pleasurable dimension, uh, uh, the idea of the modern or the early modern consumer, someone who, who visits a city perhaps uh, on some sort of, uh, of business or perhaps on some sort of administrative mission, but also wants to see the sites, wants to know what's interesting, what's, uh, you know, where should, I, where should I eat, where should I uh, go to buy uh, local products, what kinds of things should I be uh, uh, consuming here, what's this place known for. Maps, uh, often in conjunction with texts, serve uh, a key function in that area um, as well, and then I think in some ways the most uh, the most interesting uh, is is in that sense of civic pride or or what I sometimes call pride of place. The idea of simply showing off, of simply saying, "Look what a great town we are! Look what a great city we are!" Um, and I think that that's a sense of of the Chinese city which is very much at odds with uh, with some at least traditional ideas about it, with some traditional representations of it. Um, I want to close, if I can, with, with some questions because this is kind of the, 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 the point to which I have come uh, in this pro project. I don't, I don't have all the answers that I'm looking for, uh, but I've at least been able to formulate some of these questions. Why do people make maps? Um, you know, I think that, that there's a question of knowledge and information. Maps can serve to convey information. 
information and knowledge, of course, are also forms of power. And so the ability to produce maps, the ability to produce uh, visual images of cities uh, is, is a way of, of, of controlling. It's a way of controlling knowledge and information when we, when we, especially with things like the gazetteer maps, when we include some things, we exclude others. And, and how the city is portrayed uh, is a matter of choice. It's a matter of decision. So who's making those decisions? Who's making those calls? When we read, for example, the list of editors and, and uh, the editorial committees of gazetteers, what's their actual role in the production of that knowledge? To what extent are those sort of official roles, ritual gestures, and, and who's actually doing the work? We don't know a lot about Chinese cartographers per se. Are there specialists who produce maps um, as their primary activity? Uh, uh, certainly when we look at, at, for example, the map of the palaces and walls of Beijing, um, that seems to have been a, a publication of a map in and of itself. Uh, who produced that kind of image? It's not signed. We don't know uh, uh, in that particular instance who, who the cartographer was. But it would be interesting to uh, explore more uh, about that kind of stuff. Um, there's also, as I say, these, these issues of, of pride or celebration. And I think we need to understand maps more in that kind of context. Um, do city views change in the early modern period? And if so, how and why? I think they do. Um, of course, this leads us to the question of what do we mean by the early modern. That's a, that's a huge uh, issue. It's a huge uh, matter of debate. And in fact, uh, my colleague and I, uh, uh, who are we're collaborating on a comparative uh, uh, study of this, uh, we rather disagree about this. So we, uh, we kind of fight about this a lot. But you know, we'll see where that takes us. Um, are there changes in the nature of representation, such as greater accuracy? Uh, this is one of the great debates in cartographic history in general, and the history of, of Chinese cartography has largely been concerned not, not so much with, with city maps, uh, but with maps of the empire or maps of the relationship between China and the surrounding countries. Uh, uh, there hasn't been as much attention to, to maps of cities per se as, as one might hope, uh, although uh, as a researcher you're always delighted to find areas that are underexplored. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of the discourse, a lot of the, uh, the conversation about Chinese cartography has been around this issue of, of, of accuracy, of how scientific, how precise, how mathematical were they. Uh, but I think when we get down to looking at, uh, at, at cities, we can see that, that they're both scientifically accurate and not. That, that, that's actually a choice. It's not a matter of, of capacity. It's a matter of of will. It's a matter of what the purpose and the objective of the production of the image or the map was. Um, and are there changes in the roles of cities? Again, I think that, uh, that we know that there are, but we need to learn more about that. How, how did Chinese people themselves think of their cities? What were their perceptions of their cities? And to what extent uh, are those uh, attitudes reflected in, in graphic images? And finally, and this goes back to the comparative element, why do we see parallels and similarities between city views in China and Italy? And uh, why and how do maps of these places differ? Um, I think uh, myself that, uh, that the reason that we see a map such as the Stele of Suzhou in 1229 and Da Vinci's image of Imola in, in 1506, why do we see those particular kinds of representations in those particular times um, has a lot to do with the comparability of changes that are taking place. That when we see the development of, of, a, of a more commercialized economy, when we see the, uh, the, the stirrings of what will develop into capitalism or, or some form of commercial commodity economy in both China and in Europe, it's not surprising perhaps that that gives rise to changes, to, to ways of seeing, ways of viewing the city. Uh, which are uh, which are themselves comparable, and I think that as we explore the the uh, these two arenas further, that uh, that we're going to get greater insights into that. And the the last question here: What's the relationship between images and text? It's a very rich one in the Chinese experience, um, and it suggests, and I guess it reminds us of uh, of how how integrated all kinds of of uh, graphic representation are, all the arts of the brush, as it were, whether it's poetry, painting, and calligraphy as one, which is a kind of trope in art history, or the interaction between uh, maps or paintings or texts in the representation of cities. 
So this is a, uh, uh, it's, a it's a project of mine that, that as I say, is still in, in rather preliminary stages, and uh, I'm hoping to to pursue this uh, much further, and uh, when I have an opportunity to, to take it into print, and I hope that uh, it will be of interest to you and others to come. So thank you very much. And of course, I'd be happy to uh, take questions if that's uh, if that's on the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're all completely convinced by what I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Are atlases produced? Um, atlases. That's you know that's a that's a very good question, and 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 it's a question that comes up uh, uh, when when we talk about Chinese maps. Um, I don't think they're produced in anywhere near the same. Uh, uh, volume that they are in, in early modern Europe. But yes, uh, there are some atlases. There are compendia of maps. Um, there are some great uh, uh, imperial atlases that show, for example, all the different provinces. Uh, there's not that I'm aware of anything like the, uh, the great uh, urban atlases of, uh, of the 16th and 17th centuries that show you know, all these different cities in, in, uh, in great uh, Profusion. Uh, I don't think that uh, I certainly haven't come across that. I've asked some uh, uh, some scholars of Chinese print culture, like uh, Lucille Jia and uh, uh, Hilda de Wert, and and uh, they haven't been able to point me in the direction of of a good urban atlas. So uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll come across that at some point. But as far as uh, as maps that were produced prior to say the 18th century, uh, there are there is a handful of uh, of, of Kind of provincial level atlases, but I haven't seen one that's that's just an atlas of cities. Yeah. Uh -huh. Kind of random, but do you know anything about the tradition of Muslim map making? Because just in terms of China and Italy, it's obviously one of the cultures. That right. There's actually a really good book that came out about a year and a half ago by a Korean scholar that looks at um, the the influence between the interaction between uh, Islamic and, and Chinese uh, cartographic traditions. Um, and, and if I had a memory anymore, I would be able to tell you the name of that book. Um, I'll send you the citation. But it's a very good book, but it's, uh, it focuses on, um, on you know, sort of much bigger maps or maps of much bigger areas. It, it doesn't really deal with uh, urban cartography at all. Uh, but it does show, uh, um, she spends a lot of time looking at what uh, Islamic cartographers knew about Asia and what East Asian cartographers knew uh, about the Islamic world. And it's interesting because the, 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 the sort of uh, cartographic horizon for Chinese and Korean and Japanese map makers seems to have been about, uh, about the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there's a very famous Korean map from the 15th century, the Kangnido map, that, uh, that actually includes, it, it includes some, some, some things that are supposed to be Africa and Europe and have place names like Cairo and Marseille on them, but don't really look much like anything we would think of as Africa and Europe. And in fact, Africa has a gigantic lake in the middle of it. Um, but it does mean that they were aware that those places were out there, knew things like place names, just, just didn't have a very good uh, representation of that. And the same is true um, with some uh, 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 Middle Eastern maps uh, that, that, that show China, talk about place names out there. They're pretty good as far as Central Asia, and then they kind of fall apart when you get out to, to the China coast or Korea or Japan or things like that. So there is interaction and there is awareness, um, but, uh, but, but we're not getting really, really good uh, uh, um, accurate representations. Yeah. The most recent Smithsonian magazine has a little... Did Marco Polo yeah. discover America? Yeah, good, good, good piece. Um, well, they're obviously still uh, uh, being examined in a number of ways. But uh, uh, actually, I, I, I saw that piece and I showed it to my, my colleague, who's the, the Venetianist, and, uh, and I said, so what do you think about this? And uh, she's, she's actually currently working on a, on a, a project that looks at um, 
how how people came to understand the relationship between North America and uh, and and Northeast Asia, because we know, of course, that the Bering Strait is up there between Alaska and and Russia. When did knowledge of that come about? Of course, uh, uh, real accurate knowledge of it doesn't come until the 18th century. But um, for a while, North America was represented as just an extension of of Asia. What's interesting on the maps in that uh, in that article, the, the the maps that are supposedly generated by these recollections of Polo's daughter or granddaughter, I forget, um, is that it it shows that that passage. It shows uh, uh, it with with some reasonable level of accuracy a representation of what may be the Alaska coast and even even the Aleutian uh, Peninsula. Uh, in some ways, I think that's that that. It may be too good, <laughs> um, but I think I, you know it's it's interesting. Uh, uh, I, I, I remember in the article that the paper had been dated to the 15th century. Uh, they haven't done the ink dating yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see about that. Um, in some ways, it's kind of evocative of the Vinland map, uh, which was uh, a, a big phenomenon about 40 years ago, and and has kind of faded. In credibility since then, so I'll be interested to see where the where the the laboratories take us. It would be remarkable um, uh, uh, if if they prove to be authentic. But uh, uh, we'll we'll have to see these. For, I'm sorry for those of you who aren't familiar with it. There's an article in the current Smithsonian about a set of I think there's seven sheets of um, hand drawn maps that. Uh, were not produced by Marco Polo, but are attributed to uh, uh, his his daughter or granddaughter, as I say, I'm not, I don't remember exactly. Um, that uh, that sh that that show China, East Asia, Korea, Japan, and and apparently uh, the North Pacific, including uh, what looks like a, a bit of Alaska and certainly the the Bering Strait, the gap between Russia and uh, and North America, uh, and and they're being examined. There's a number of scholars uh, who have looked at them and, and and think they may actually be be genuine uh, images uh, deriving from Polo's uh, recollections, but uh, uh, they're still being studied in terms of the materials that were used and whether they might be you know subsequent forgeries or something like that. Yeah. Going back to Sujo, I'm just really curious about the street in front, water in the back. And yes. If you could, um, you hinted a little bit, but I'm just curious about what was the impetus or inspiration for that reform. Yeah, uh, my understanding is, uh, and 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 I'm I'm trying to dig around in in some gazetteers for some fuller uh, information, but. Um, what uh, uh, what I've what I've been able to discover so far is that uh, uh, you know there there'd been kind of uh, I suppose you could say unregulated development, shall we say, uh, and um, there there'd been a lot of kind of uh, ad hoc construction um, that uh, uh, that that had just had just made the streets, the intersections, uh, uh, the the flow of of goods uh, within the city. Uh, you know, it, it, population was growing. It was becoming very dense. A lot of inbuilding was going on, and what they wanted to do was kind of streamline things so that the streets were clear, shops could face onto the streets with with pretty pretty good access. People could could move around comfortably, and the canals would be clear. You know, people weren't extending things out into the water and and blocking the flow of or the passage of barges and stuff like that. So the idea was basically to straighten things up, get things. Um, into a more planned and regulated uh, form, and, uh, and 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 kind of keep them that way. And and the map serves both to illustrate uh, the work that had been done, and of course as a as a as a template for how things should stay. Right? Yeah. Also, have something to do with fire, the danger of fires, as we saw in Kanto. Sure. Yeah, that no, there certainly are probably fiscal elements as well. Yeah. I'll stand up so people can hear me. I, I have a methodological question. As you've taken us through this subject, I 
feel that we're having all the time an aerial view. Uh -huh. And I, I think that's a, that's a really, really good strategy, given the fact that this is virgin territory. And it seems to me that you're trying to establish a typology, both a typology for different kinds of maps uh, with different purposes and also uh, changes over time. My question is, um, in your uh, pursuit, um, are you going to go into individual maps in a kind of, if I may use the term, explication de carte? In other words, like uh, literary scholars do with an explication de texte, do that with the maps, and particularly you have this absolutely fascinating interplay between the image and the text. And um, one of the, the questions behind my question is, it, suppose you have two maps of the same type, however you um, articulate that. Yeah. Are you going to gain anything by going into each of those maps in a very, very detailed, meticulous, microscopic way? And is this part of your project? Uh, yes. It is part of the project, and, and so therefore the answer to are you going to gain anything is I sure hope so. Um, yeah, uh, that, uh, uh, the Explication de Cartes is, is, uh, is of course a major uh, enterprise. Um, some of the maps, this one uh, is one that, that I've already started uh, fiddling with a little bit because it's, it has a, a, a tremendous amount of information, uh, and I'm curious about exactly what that is. Um, you know what's identified. Um, I, I noticed just uh, just in, in in going over it preliminarily that that many of the buildings are are identified by their height, uh, uh, given in Zhang. You know, and and uh, that that seems kind of funny on this particular map to have these this sort of quanti quantitative dimension. So I want to I want to look at that. Um, the same goes with this one. I want to. Uh, uh, I haven't gone over this in great detail yet, but uh, a lot of it is, is is pretty straightforward. A lot of things are just names of, of particular districts, and I want to correlate that with the text, um, and and go through the text itself. Uh, fortunately, this particular guidebook is not really massive, um, so I, I think that's a that's a manageable project. But yeah, I think that that to to get down to that level of detail, to get down to exactly. What, what buildings are portrayed, how are they portrayed, what's the spatial relationship between things. I think that that level of close reading is, is really imperative. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm up for sabbatical in another year, and uh, my hope is to, to spend that year uh, uh, really with, a, with a, 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 a much more detailed approach to, to some of these maps. On the other hand, <laughs> the, um, the Bell Library at the University of Minnesota has has uh, uh, created a an online uh, data set of 680 some gazetteer maps, uh, and and I want to explore those too. You know, so uh, it, there's a I, I have a, a, a sort of tension between quantity and quality, um, uh, and I've, I'm not yet entirely sure how I'm going to resolve that. But uh, maybe I'll just need more time. But uh, yeah, I think that the close reading of of these maps. Um, there are some there's some sort of standard works that that provide uh, uh, guidelines on on how to look at a map. What sorts of things do we look at? I've been reading those things, and and this this whole cartographic thing is a new area for me. I'm used to dealing with um, you know memorials and poetry and stuff like that, but uh, I've I've grown kind of fascinated by it. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do those closer readings. Yeah. Just wondering about your methodology. Uh, just wondering if you're linking these also to the demographics, the social and economic needs. So you, in one of your questions, you said, is this not for knowledge or is this not for celebration? Right. Well, if, if the town has grown so big that people can't find their way around or there are a lot of strangers that are coming in because of commerce, then there's that map is needed. Right. And I just wonder if part of what you're going to be doing is linking that the development of the cities and the demographics and the social changes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, the for me um, one of the, one of the points of the exercise ultimately 
is to have a better is is to use these maps, use the question of of how cities are portrayed, how they're viewed, um, and and how those portrayals and views are then consumed or utilized. Um, what what can that tell us about the the changes that are taking place in early modern China? Um, I am uh, I'm a little old school in some ways, and and think that when we when we look at uh, at, at social and cultural history, we have to ground that in uh, in economic history. We have to ground that in the in the material dimension, and maps are are both material objects in themselves, but also at least intended to be illustrative of, of certain material realities. And so, yeah, I, I very much want to look at, at the economics and the demographics. Um, Suzhou, this is Beijing, but, but Suzhou is, of course, um, this, this wonderful commercially dynamic city that's been studied quite a bit, um, including uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, French, Sino-French project on uh, on uh, uh, the spatiality of Suzhou that's been going on for about 20 years, uh, that that has found and uh, and brought to light uh, quite a number of maps of the city, and and it's fascinating to to go over those in terms of uh, the changes that take place. Suzhou uh, is one of the places where um, uh, labor history in China gets its earliest start. Some of the some of the earliest uh, 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 labor organizing strikes, riots, things like that. Uh, take place there because it's uh, it's an early manufacturing center. The early development of the textile industry is very extensive there. So, embedding these images, embedding um, the history of, of of urban cartography in that in that social uh, base, social and economic base. Yeah, that's I think that's imperative. Yeah. These maps created by what you would call professional cartographers or was that developing as a science slash art? That, that's a question that I don't know the answer to yet. Um, and that's an, that's an interesting, it's a fascinating question. Uh, my, my Europeanist colleague uh, uh, tells me, and, and I certainly believe her, um, that, that uh, cartography as a specialty uh, is, is very well developed in, in uh, Renaissance Europe. Um, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of that yet uh, in terms of like named cartographers uh, in, in the Chinese tradition. There's a few individuals whose names have popped up in connection with maps. Um, and I do have the names of, of the fellows who, who drew and then carved the great Sujo Stili. Uh, I haven't had time yet to, to get into biographical reference works and try to, try to run them down. But uh, I suspect there's not going to be a lot of information about somebody who's carving steely. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe there'll be more, um, uh, maybe there'll be some access. I, my suspicion is that there's not um, real professional cartographers, that, that uh, just as your, your scholar officials were also your painters and your poets, I suspect that uh, some of them were also your cartographers and that that was simply a, a skill set that, that some people added into others. But maybe that's not right. Maybe in the growth of the commercial economy, uh, there there was a, a sufficient niche for this that uh, that I'll be able to to trace that out. But it's a question to which I don't have an answer at this point. So make it a good one. Maybe not. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been helpful to me, and I hope it was of interest to you. <laughs>